Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Still feeling a bit down in the dubs for the past few days after hearing the news on the late great horror writer and director Wes Craven, who passed away on Sunday at the age of 76 due to brain cancer. And already I just started class on Tuesday, and only one class, you know, which is only on Tuesdays and Thursdays only. Yeah, because already my family is is already starting college already and they're probably going to spend the whole uh, week you know doing with all the work that they had to deal with yeah well I only have one class yeah well I decided I'll just you know take a break for now until we figure it out uh, what kind of class I'll take um, as far as all the semesters go you know next year you know, so I decided I'll just you know do whatever I want at this point so anyway, I just watched a surprisingly good supernatural horror movie, since now we're getting to that subject, which actually made its debut at last year's Cannes Film Festival, and it's already being critically acclaimed by critics since its U.S. debut on March 14, 2015, yeah, the same weekend as uh, Disney's live-action version Cinderella, yep already just came out on Blu-ray and DVD as we speak since um, this summer it's a movie called It Follows which is about a young girl who wants up being uh, pursued by a supernatural identity after a sexual encounter it stars Belika Moreau Kira Gilchrist, Olivia Lucardi, Lily Sippe, Daniel Savato, Jake Wary, Bailey Spry, Debbie Williams, Ruby Harris, Lisa Polito, and Il Berhard. And it's written and directed by David Robert Mitchell. The movie begins somewhere in Detroit, Michigan, follows a young girl who flees from her house already being chased by someone that she saw and already in fear she wants up uh, being chased all the way around the street until her father arrives and only to find out if she's okay or not so then she went back into the house with her father until all of a sudden she drives to the beach where she tearfully calls her mother and father to see what's happening and by morning she's been brutally murdered so then a college student named Jay who wants up going out with her boyfriend Hugh to go see a movie which happens to be charade with Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn yeah classic film by the way and inside the theater while uh, one of the managers was playing uh, the organ you know before the movie starts yeah Hugh actually points out a woman that's standing at the entrance of the theater who Jay cannot see. And fearful enough, he demands that they decided to leave by going straight to the exit. And they went straight into the car just so they could wind up uh, escaping and, and be able to spend more time with their date by, you know, going out, eating out, and... You know, have fun, and, and then, of course, you know, they decided to have sex in the car with each other at a uh, at a local hotel. You know, they just parked their car on the side. And after which, Hugh wants up incapitated her with chloroform. Then Jay woke up being tied to a wheelchair inside an abandoned uh, parking lot. Hugh actually explains that their sex had been passed on on the curse, which turned out to be an identity, yeah, a ghost, which can only be seen for those with the curse and can take on the appearance of any person. It will start following Jay at a walking pace, and if it catches her, it will kill her and wants up being pursued by the previous person who had passed it on. So with that aside, they spotted a naked woman walking towards them, and Hugh wants up, you know, 
while uh, Jay on, on the wheelchair trying to move around and then later Hugh drives Jay home and flees. So then the next day already the cops had came and they couldn't find the woman or Hugh who's been living under a false identity. Yep, as we speak. So then at school Jay sees an old woman in a hospital gown walking towards her already being invisible to others. Jay's sister Kelly and her friends Paul and Yara who agreed to help and spend the night in the same house while Paul investigates a smashed kitchen window but winds up not spotting anybody but her where she saw a half-naked woman who's already peeing around you know, as we spotted she's already walking towards her and then suddenly she screams and and she tries to escape by going upstairs to the others who cannot see her yeah so they try to go inside the room until all of a sudden then she spotted a tall man you know with no eyes as we speak already going right past uh, Yara and he enters inside the bedroom as Jay tries to flee the house and rides on the bike to a nearby playground where her friends found her. So with the help of their neighbor Greg they discover that Hugh's real name is actually Jeff Webman and they decided to trace him to his address. Jeff informs them that he got the curse from a one night stand at a local bar and actually told them that Jay has to pass it on to someone you know who can deal with it. So the group drives to Greg's lake house where Jay had learned to fire a gun so in case of the identity appears. So already you know making all these uh, strange disguises the identity also disguised as, uh, as Yara. They try to escape by going inside the house already you know with the identity aside already grabbing her hair as they spotted it you know already which turned out to be as we speak they're trying to get rid of the identity already you know with with Paul trying to smack the identity you know with the chair and then suddenly he's being pushed over already leaving out all these marks on the stomach um, already they try to go straight into the house or just to hide and while well, um, Jay decided to use a gun just to shoot the identity but once up uh, recovering then all of a sudden we started spotting the the tall man again you know already to uh, smash the door identity already changing it to to that kid who wants up uh, you know spying on on Jay you know whenever she started swimming on on the swimming pool you know she's yeah, that, that little kid is basically a pervert. So then Jay wants a fleeing inside Greg's car, but wants a crashing into a, a cornfield, which um, which then she woke up in a hospital with a broken arm. So then Greg had agreed to sleep with Jay in order to pass on the curse, you know, by having sex, only to insist that he doesn't believe in what's going on. So days later, Jay had once of spotting Greg smashing a window to his own house and enters. She tries to warn the real Greg on the telephone but wants of not answering. She wants into the house and finds the identity in the form of Greg's half-naked mother knocking at his door and wants of jumping on Greg and rapes him completely and then of course he dies after that. So Jen Jay decided to free from the car by spending the night outdoors and then wants up on the beach to spot only three young men on the boat. So she tries to go in just to see what's going on. So then back home, Jay refused uh, Paul's offer by having sex. And she's already, you know, drained out the, the pool and and all that. So then they decided that the group was going to plan on killing the identity by luring into an abandoned swimming pool by using all these electrical devices into the water. But before they went into the pool, Jay actually spotted a nude man on top of the house roof. And while Jay is raiding in the pool already spotting the identity, 
realized that it's taken its appearance of her fodder as they throw the device at her. By firing at the invisible target, Paul accidentally wounds uh, Yara, but winds up shooting the identity in the head as it falls into the pool. Yeah, already you know, dragging Jay underwater. He tries to shoot again once Jay escapes, and he did. He finally got him. So then the identity leaves a cloud of blood, but we didn't spot any body whatsoever. So then after that, Jay and Paul decided to have sex, just to see what's going to happen next. And then Paul wants up driving past the prostitutes in the city part of the town, you know, where everything just seems all messed up as we speak. All, all abandoned and everything. And then after that, Jay and Paul decided to walk down the street holding hands with each other while someone actually appears to be following them. And then the movie ends. I guess that's what David Robert Mitchell was coming up with. A fear of an anxiety about what was it like if someone you did not know wants up watching you and follows you everywhere you go already being chased by that particular person and was ready to attack you all the way around because of that one curse that you had that just will never go away that's exactly what he did when he made this movie because he actually experiencing this ever since he started having nightmares as a child you know during his parents divorce he, keep, he kept having nightmares of someone who did not know wants up chasing him around until he was woken up in fear. And I should know this because I think everybody has that experience too whenever they started having nightmares of that particular person. Um, whatever disguises that, that may be, it turned out to be, as we speak, a ghost you know, of some sort that wants up chasing them around and ready to attack you completely. And it's just, it's really scary. I mean, when you think about it. Yeah. But I had to say, for a horror film like It Follows, this was very well made. And I really enjoyed it, too. Yeah, I like the fact that it had sort of a 70s vibe towards it. You could see all the the technology and all the other stuff, even the furniture and the houses, the cars, you name it. They all seem like they all came from the 70s. Even though they did have sort of a mix of of some 90s and and pretty much today's technology, such as the, the TV screen. You know, while they were watching all these horror films on TV or science fiction movies. Also, uh, Jay's best friend, uh, Yara as he has uh, a shell pod or at this rate a shell ebook and that's pretty much what she shows throughout the entire film where she started reading all these uh, books of of whatever science fiction novels that that um, they already had set up on on the ebook so most of the time she just reads on her uh, shell book <laughs> yeah i like that too i thought that was clever yeah, you know, for the director. And I, I also love the score that's done by synthesizers. That, that it was actually in the tradition of John Carpenter because he's been best known for using all of his composing by using synthesizers uh, in, all, in all of his films. Because he always likes to use all these beats, you know, towards it. I mean, he definitely used those beats to make it more chilling than ever before. And I love that. It was actually done by... A composer named uh, Richard Breland, whose stage name was simply called Disaster Piece. So, yes, and he started coming up with the music uh, since he learned the guitar in high school and started writing music at the age of 17. And he's been doing that ever since. Yeah. So, I, I like the fact that he started using that particular um, synthesizer beats you know, towards it for, for this particular movie alone. I like the fact that they use this tradition of, of George A. Romero when it comes to the the identity once of moving around like like zombies. You know, they're walking very slowly, 
as it tries to follow towards the victim. Yeah, that she can only see, but others can't. Yeah. And I also love the cinematography. Yeah, everything seems, you know, well paced as it se as it was going on. I mean, for its tone. Yeah, I, I like the shots of, of basically, you know, all these close-up shots of of uh, Jay, her friends, and and all the rooms that she's been in. Yeah, her bedroom. Yeah, especially when she's trying to, you know, get ready to to go out with uh, her boyfriend Hugh, who has, of course, uh, a different identity uh, of his own. And yeah, a lot of shots of of all the houses, you know, already being damaged completely. You can even tell how abandoned it looks, because you can tell how Detroit, Michigan, is looking as we speak. Yeah, all messed up. Yeah, we started seeing everything that's just as abandoned, like like it's a ghost town. There uh, are all these houses being boarded up or damaged or anything. And you get to see all these other places too, um, all the way around in that particular area. Even though you do get to see all the beautiful houses on the other side of the corners. Everywhere. It was beautifully shot over there at Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, because it shows how how you can actually do a film that's that could be either a horror film or any kind for this particular location and it's it shows you could do movies like this yeah I, I even like the shots of the beach of uh, the playground you know even the swimming pool that she has and even though um, yeah there's a lot of sex scenes in the film yeah, I mean, mostly showing uh, the woman's underwear and and all of that, you know. And the fact that the two neighbors um, next door, at this rate, the kid started watching her <laughs> while swimming in, in the swimming pool. The kid is definitely a peeping Tom, <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah, there was a lot of that. And the actors themselves uh, weren't so bad either. I mean, they're not as annoying as most of the other horror movies we've seen these days. I mean, where everything's all, you know, CGI, blood, lots of jump scares, tons of horror cliches that we often see these days. And and the fact that, you know, they started using all these shaky cams all the time. And, you know, all these found footages that we often see. I mean, none of that here. This is pretty much like the horror movies of its time, you know, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I mean, this is the horror films that we grew up with. This is exactly what horror films should be made nowadays. Instead of the usual garbage that we often have. Yeah, as well as the remakes as we speak. I mean, we need movies like this. I mean, we need more of its originality. And this is exactly what it is. This is an original film about what was it like having a fear of anxiety of someone of some strange uh, encounter that's actually happening once you started having sex uh, with your boyfriend or girlfriend and suddenly it creates this curse that wants to pass it to the next victim once it follows and shows you know so with that aside I really did enjoy this movie, and I'm glad that this movie got made. I'm glad it had a lot of good reviews, a very well made 100 minutes of how scary this film is. In fact, I'm surprised because this movie, of course, had its budget of $2 million, a, a very low budget film, it made $17.8 million at the box office. So I can see that's what the money went for. It. Like I say it's it's fun. I mean, it has that creativity, and that's exactly what we need. So anyway, I give it follows five stars. I'm Joseph Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.